Thanks, Alice. Um, I'm just going to load um, a quick set of slides. Can everyone see that? Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, as Alice has just been saying, we're kind of interested because we've been in Wales for maybe 15 years um, and um, reflecting on um, maybe uh, our own, um, our own uh, challenges of uh, running a practice from a rural location when in fact we are not really familiar with the landscape in which we live and work. So the next um, six fortnightly sessions are going to possibly offer us this opportunity to uh, talk to a range of practices, not necessarily about the detail of their work, uh, but more about the detail of their general practice and the methods by which they either gain work, deliver work, the type of relationships that you need to forge when you're working outside of metropolitan centres, and finding a different way of um, maybe conversing on this platform uh, when there's such a sort of content heavy range of uh, offer. So that's going to take in areas of Scandinavia, um, projects that have been delivered by other practices outside of their own country, so a little bit about interlopers, as well as academics who are writing about the rural condition, but also practicing and delivering buildings. So tonight, which uh, obviously uh, includes two UK-based practitioners who you're both probably well aware of, um, as well as moving across to Portugal and uh, Mallorca and other areas of Southern Europe, just to discuss the, the differences that practices have, because I think we have very uh, different London-centric model for, um, for the profession in the UK, which I find very interesting to discuss when I start to uh, put my tentacles out and find relationships with other rural practices based in, here, in the UK and Ireland. But also it gives potentially an opportunity to reflect on 50 or 60 years of regionalism and um, a number of practitioners who were really under the radar at their given time from Rudolf Olgiati uh, to Peter Aldington, of course, teaching at Cambridge when he built his famous house, uh, to Pino Pizzagoni, working in the Lombardy region, uh, producing some staggering work with very humble palette materials. And then of course, uh, a devout modernist, uh, Alberto Ponis, uh, delivering some incredible buildings in Sardinia. But tonight is really about Mary and Jonathan. Uh, why have we put these together? Well, I think they're both producing um, unbelievably well resolved buildings in rural locations, in very, very different landscapes and uh, different contexts. But more predominantly, they've been, both been practicing in rural locations for over 20 years, the majority of their professional working life. And that interests me because that's a period that I'm sort of working towards at the moment. And there is a sort of shared empathy and admiration for their work that we as a practice have. Mary obviously is based just, uh, just north of Perth uh, in, Dun in, in Dunkeld, uh, but obviously for many, many years was based on Sky. Uh, until recently setting up her practice in the last five or six years. But what I like about Mary is that she's probably one of the most um, balanced of uh, rural architects in the sense that she seems to have this wonderful balance between her work life and her home life. Being an avid hill walker, um, mountain biker and kayaker, even kayaking to some of her sites. Uh, but being able to as well be immersed in the landscape and understanding what a site needs by spending a lot of time there before delivering really well, cleverly crafted buildings, which from the outset almost look impossible for me to imagine how you'd even construct with these landscapes. And really drawing on her understanding of the agricultural land, land that's there and the buildings that form the settlements in which she's building. And then secondly to Jonathan, I came across Jonathan in 2009, thanks to um, Jonathan Sergison actually recommending I get in touch. I met him at a symposium in North Wales and um, I didn't even know of Jonathan at the time. Two, two years later, he was Young Architect of the Year. He's based um, on the edge of the Humber in Lincolnshire, where he was born and bred, and a very different landscape from Mary. 
um, the Fenlands, very intense agricultural land, very flat, but producing just incredible uh, contemporary architecture, which seems to sit very comfortably in the context that it's provided. And this, remember, is some work that was being produced in his early 30s, quite staggering really when he'd spent a relatively modest period of time working in London for other practices. And um, I have great admiration for the way he can deliver almost anything within uh, different rural settings to such a high standard. So tonight we've called it Kindred Spirits as the sort of the episode, the first episode. Kindred Spirits because actually it was only some years later that I realized that Mary and Jonathan were friends. And um, so I thought this was uh, potentially a, a nice title to have as well as also the fact that um, I have a shared empathy for the work that they produce. So maybe if I stop coming off this and go back to Mary and um, Jonathan, do you want to just, I don't know whether everyone can see you dotted in amongst all of these other people. Um, can we get, Mary, you, uh, is your mic on or is it off? It's off. Is that okay? Great, great. I'm going, to, I'm going to start the conversation really with you because could we debunk this friendship thing? Because uh, I assumed it was because you were both uh, working in London very early in your uh, mm. professional careers before disappearing to the countryside, but it's not the case, is it? No, no, no. I was asked to convene a, the Inverness Architects Association biannual jolly, which is a little prize giving thing, and they're all quite fun. And I, then I are, I've, I've been an admirer of, of Jonathan for a long time in a kind of shifty way. <laughs> so I stalked him and I asked him if he'd come, and I asked Hugh Strange if he'd come, another of my heroes, really. And I asked Neil Lesby come, and they came. And they came, and so we had a. They talked about their work, and we had a lovely time. And then we had a prize giving, and everyone got a prize because it's like primary school. And then we had a Kaylee. And then next day, I made Jonathan do a site visit, even, and he he got up and did a site visit with me. We had a really good talk. Yeah. I, so, and since then, I've tried to get do collaborations. I'm really genuinely interested in collaborations. I feel a bit. Um, professionally uh, lonely often and it, so we came up recently with trying to do a project on Isla but Isla is quite tricky to get to now. only I've been to site. <laughs> okay. Jonathan how many years ago was this that you you went to Inverness? Um, I guess it was probably seven years ago. Yeah. Okay so, yeah. so it's, a, it's a fairly healthy friendship that you've been building slowly trying to get to the point where you can work together. Um, oh, why, do you, Mary, why do you feel it's so important to collaborate given the strength of your work as it stands? Oh, well that's very nice because uh, uh, Neil Gillespie and I have had these conversations about self-doubt and I do struggle with it and I don't think it's a bad thing whenever I teach there's always loads I think it, it's something you should work on and celebrate and use but so and it means I spent hours, I mean just days and days and reworking things. And I don't have, so I would like to work with others, but I, it's a difficult thing, collaboration. I've, I've stalked several people actually, it's kind of weird and creepy. <laughs> and my old friends, Steve Tompkins I've stalked, you know, then I haven't got anywhere. He was really keen at one stage. So do you think it's more about, um, maybe not collaboration, but having critical friends in the sense of sort of uh, peer review? Yeah, no, but I work with some really talented guys and they certainly do that. But the, one of my problems is I'm the one who tends to go be on site. I know the places better than anyone and, and uh, I'm genuine when I say I like to I respond to the site. So it's often just me who knows the intricacies of it on the macro and on the micro scale. So I can get into to Ireland. He's still got an invitation, obviously. Could you possibly <laughs> describe that then in terms of the, the length of time you take on yeah. site? Uh, on-site visits because obviously a lot of your sites are incredibly remote. Yeah, so. look, I have the luxury or okay. I, I, I can go for days and days. I don't really, I don't need to come home essentially. I'm in a, that position that n no one would notice where I am. Really. So I go with my bike and my boat and I persuade friends to come with me and I spend days and traveling around and seeing this. I like to see the site at every 
season, every time of day, every weather condition. I really like to see it and camp on it. You know, but I do have that luxury that lots of people don't. You know. Okay, is that a luxury because of the way you run the practice or just um, because it's really part of your DNA no, at all for a climber? And I have no one who relies on me. So I just, I'm just drift about and I have, I'm sorry, I put it more. I do mix my uh, personal life and my work life. Not, I mean, it's just the same thing, really. I go, I read and I spend time on sites and I camp and I walk them and I kayak them and I bike them and I stand over them and pace them. So I'm a lot on site a lot, yeah. So when you when you're engaging with a with a new client, is this part of the kind of the conversation you'll explain to them in terms of your the the, the intensity of that process? Yeah, I try. I'm trying to do slow architecture. I've done fast architecture in the past, and I like to do slow architecture and try and engage with that. That it takes give me time. And that is not always terribly successful. I'm sure that's the same with you. But, um, I think it's the same in all practices, isn't it? Yeah. So we make loads of models and then we make sketch models and then we draw, I draw sketch and then I throw things away and then we use them for the fire and then we make more models and of course bits and, and then I go back to site. So it's a, it's a long process. And then I'm in a process of reducing a lot, you know, distilling and reducing and simplifying. <laughs> How long would the conceptual process take before you're even getting to a planning position? Oh God, months. Yes, yeah, six months. If I have, my, <coughs> excuse me, if I have my way, yeah. But clients are often in a hurry, aren't they? And then I go back and I come back and then I. But I have I trick my friends into going with me. I pretend I'm on a kayaking holiday and they just and they fall for it. <laughs> so uh, a lot of them have rumbled me. I pretend we're on a kayaking on we turn. Yeah, I made one of one friend kayak from. Um, Malik over to Egg and then over to Mark. It's quite committed paddle for a site visit, you know. Just to be there and just to feel it again and get her feedback and things. But um, yeah, it's a it's a luxury. I don't have kids and all that, you know. I don't even have a dog. I don't have a. I don't have any reason to be home, and I love camping. So <laughs> I just go. It suits the it suits the life balance. Jonathan, the work life balance doesn't apply to me. So you know, I can understand it for others. But. Jonathan, you've got you've got a different predicament. I was it was interesting reading reading up on you again that um you're you're, you're born and bred though really to the region of Lincolnshire, um so it's it's not really something that's unfamiliar to you. I think that's what's interesting for me and Mary. Mary's an interloper like me. She didn't grow up in Scotland. She obviously grew up in London and then moved there as an adult. And I've done the same with Wales. Um, how do you think that sets you up differently in practice? Um, because I, I suppose, I found it incredibly time-consuming to sort of build a network and build relationships in practice um, in this rural location when everything is unfamiliar. I definitely helped. I mean, I came back here and got invited to a kind of business lunch, um, which I was a bit anti at the time, kind of getting involved in those type of, type of kind of business networking um, clubs, but I thought, well, I need to go along because I don't have any work. And I met a guy there, he, he owned a barn, um, and I got a commission. So the project that you showed earlier, the barn project, that was one of the first projects that we got. And that was purely by going along to this kind of lunch meeting. And of course, those things then snowball because then they know someone else and they talk about this architect that's come from London and they have a project. And also, I guess, you have the luxury that I know not in the area. I'm from the area, family are from the area. So I had kind of contacts when I came back. And I had an opportunity of doing a, an indoor swimming pool for a friend. Um, so this is how it kind of happened. And then slowly you get clients and contacts that I didn't know, I didn't have contact with, um, purely because they've seen the work or they've seen, they know, friends of, that I've done work for and it kind of just escalated really. um, <clears throat> but it was an incredibly slow process I must say you know this was um, I, I came back from London and I was working for Jamie Fober at the time became an associate and kind of felt like I was getting locked into 
London and I had to make a decision. Do I stay here or do I leave and go back to Lincolnshire? And I like the idea that um, <clears throat> maybe there was an opportunity to work in a more rural location. And I think that was because that's my personality. You know, I, I was struggling with the city um, towards the end of my time in London, if I'm honest. You know, deep down, I, I'm, I'm a country boy. I'm not a city, city boy. Um, so for me, this was, this was the right thing to do. And I had this kind of bizarre idea that if it didn't work out, I could always go back to London. You know, I'd try it. I was 30 at the time. I'd give it a shot and see what happens. And I guess 20 years later, I'm still here. So we must be doing something, something <laughs> right. I, I like the, um, I think it was in an ROBA journal article about you in 2012, where it described you as plowing your own furrow, as if you sort of, were happy just getting on with your own work, almost oblivious to the London scene. Would that still be a reflection? Yeah, I think that's really important for us as a practice. Um, and I, I, I try and um, avoid architecture as much as I possibly can. And I know that's probably seems bizarre to most people listening, but um, for me, you know, we're, we're here on our, our, on our own, doing our own thing. And that's really important. And it works about the place that we're working in, and it's not about the latest scene or the, the, the latest movement. You know, it's not about what everyone else is doing for us. I mean, that's not something I'm interested in at all. This is just about a response to a brief, a site, a client, a budget, which you can imagine working in Lincolnshire um, can be challenging at times. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, my books are predominantly about landscape, <laughs> um, planting, gardening, um, history of the walls, you know, history of landscape, that kind of stuff. I, I, I'm not, I'm not kind of tuned into, um, you know, what's going on in other parts of the world. It's not something that really interests me. Mary, you, um, you mentioned this to me when I contacted you about this, mm -hmm. saying that you weren't reading architecture. You were slightly anxious that we were going to be having a kind of highbrow architectural conversation. No, I don't. He said, actually, no, I'm, I'm reading about other things. And I said, that's perfect. That's what I want to discuss. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's the things that make us tick. Could you tell us what you're reading at the moment? Uh, I, I, I read where I'm going to. Uh, David Gange wrote a fantastic book um, called The Frayed Atlantic Edge, which I read too fast and rereading it. And I gave all the book away. Uh, so he's a historian, he's a kayaker. And if you if you walk on these landscapes, there's quite a lot of, there's quite a sense of a displaced people. You know, there are amazing ruins and clappings and gatherings and settlement patterns in the ground. Anyway, he, he's, he's as a historian, he's really understood them and he researched them. Uh, then I, when I'm on, I was reading Adam Nicholson, who writes The Seabirds Cry. So there's a lot of nature writing and things. And um, when I was in Ascent, Norman McCabe's poetry, you know, I'm just reading about place a lot. I, all books I read anyway have a, good, a real sense of place. And I'm fascinated by landscape and how it, how, how it affects people. So uh, landscape is my thing, I have to say, and I read about it. Uh, Man Shepherd in the Cairngorms, obviously. All the, you know, all the obvious nature writers I read about. I do, I don't, I do have a, I try not to sort of, you know how students go on about precedent and they pull some precedent off Google and, it, and it's kind of unrelated to that place and culture. I'm like Jonathan, I, if I got a commission in China, I wouldn't have a clue what to do. Well, I wouldn't get one, let's be honest, but I don't know that landscape. I've got jobs in the Lake District and even that landscape is more pastoral than what I'm used to, but I'm interested in it. It's more uh, considered and controlled. But, because, but I am interested in how I respond to that landscape. Like I say, both in a major context, but also in the very key of how the building hits that land. I'm all, forever chasing contours around <laughs> buildings and drawings and things, and how we, float, how, how we relate to that landscape in a very precise way. Are those conversations that you feel you can have with clients? I mean, uh, about poetry or nature or is it very much their approach and just purely from the work they're seeing in magazines I, or website? I don't know about Jonathan but I find that I, I want to get to know the clients and their response to it and then I can bring 
the mine in Sepley. I re they really want to talk, because it's such a personal thing. Mostly I do private houses, it's such a personal thing. And what, when they're talking about it, it's not necessarily the solution they're describing a brief, you know? So I'm really uh, keen to listen and to be there on site with them and understand them also where they live now and how they live and how they dream and all these things. So I, I prefer to listen and tell them about great books I've been reading. You know, I do introduce them to I've introduced clients to some really serious mountaineering kit to keep them dry. <laughs> serious over trousers for certain clients, for example. But uh, no, I don't try not to. I'm trying to listen, honestly. Look and listen first. Okay. Jonathan, um, your portfolio in many ways, when I kind of dug deep to sort of look at the breadth of it, you're, you're, you're servicing a number of different types of clients from a rural setting, aren't you? Some are property developers, if I've got this right. Some are almost sort of estate owners. And then others are private, uh, private sort of uh, dwellings or, or even organizations. Yep. How, how have you built that when your practice is relatively small, isn't it, as a team? Yeah, I mean, we're a very small practice. I mean, we flip between four, five, six is the maximum I think we've ever been. And, and that's partly to do with the amount of work that we have in the practice, but also it's to do with, um, I created this problem for myself, but people come to the practice because they want me to lead a project for them. So we found historically it's very different, difficult for me to let people in the office take charge of things. You know, there's been cases where I haven't attended a meeting and the client would phone and say, why didn't you come to the meeting? Well, because I didn't think I needed to go to that specific meeting, but I, I understand the content of the meeting. Well, we came to the office to work with you, not, not, you know, not one of your assistants. And that's not the competence of the assistant, but it's, it's just, um, that's the way it goes. You know, people want to be sat around a table listening to, to, to me talk. Um, and not someone from the, from the office. I mean, that's not an unusual predicament for most practitioners, but I think in a rural um, setting, do you find that you maybe have um, almost sort of uh, developed a kind of kingdom of your own there? I mean, there's not a great deal of competition that you're working against. I mean, you, are you having to go up against other practices to win work? Yeah, I mean, we do. There are other practices. Um, in Lincolnshire, that's for sure. But um, our clients tend to come to us because they like what we do as a practice. So that's a great starting point for us as architects. Because instantly they've got an interest in our work. So that allows us to have a freer hand when we start talking about possibilities for a project. Um, and we're not about it's not always about pitching for, you know, the, the, the cheapest price gets the job. Now we do have that problem, but we don't win those projects because, you know, we're not, <laughs> we're not ever going to be probably the cheapest. So, because it's the process that we go through and, and, and it's the outcome of that process that we believe is very different to what other people are probably producing in, in, in particularly in Lincolnshire, that's for sure. I, I, one of my bigger problems, I think, in, in, in practice when I first moved down here was that I, I was surrounded by what I call rather um, rudely bodgers, um, people who were sort of delivering architectural services for, but for absolutely rock bottom prices. And I think commercially I had to make a decision very quickly. Was I going to try and compete with them or just try and sort of provide a, a kind of a totally different offer? Did you have that same problem when you started in Lincoln or just because of your connections that didn't become a problem? I mean, price is always a challenge. Yeah, no, we had those problems. I mean, you know, the majority of the British public don't understand what an architect does for a living, and don't understand the services that they provide. So of course you can find yourself, historically we found ourselves pitching against um, a variety of people who were claiming to be architects, some of them, some were technicians, some of them were draftsmen. You know, and the first battle was putting this kind of case together, which was about we're very different, we're providing a very different service, and then we have very different qualifications. But you know, that's that's challenging. But the reality is, we quickly learned that you know those clients aren't for us anyway, because they're not going to want to go on to this on this journey that we want to take them on, and they're not going to want to spend the time that we need to you know make a project for them. So those clients. It won't work, and, and the, you know, the few times that we 
tried to take on those projects, it was clear that it was not a process that was um, for them and it was not something for us. So when, when, we, when we met last summer, you, um, you told me that story that where I think that you made that judgment on it or that judgment call on the client and your wife obviously who works with you in the business was sort of saying, why are you doing that? Because commercially it was sort of almost looked like suicide. Whereas I think, is, is, that a, is that a critical judgment as well about the work that you're trying to deliver? Because everything seems so incredibly well executed and well resolved. That takes a certain investment from the client as much as from yourself. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I came to Lincolnshire to be a serious architect. I didn't come here to get away from, from doing good architecture. You know, for me, that's absolutely what the practice is about, is doing the best work that we can do uh, you know with our capabilities and, and our skill set and and so yeah i mean we've had times in the past where we have had very little work that the work isn't the right work when the phone rings and someone wants a certain type of work doing and you know we've said that's not the type of project we would take on of course <laughs> we have to live and we have to pay bills and all the rest of it but you know we have to also maintain what we're about as a practice. You know, it's a bit like if, if I was a chef and, and I was wanting to be, you know, a Michelin star chef's very different to someone that's growing a calf and they both serve a purpose, don't they? And I'm not by any means here saying that I'm equivalent to a Michelin star chef, but what I'm trying to say is that we're trying to do interesting work and, you know, an interesting meal takes more preparation, with more, more thought ingredients, and there's more of a process than going to grease a calf for a bacon butter. Mary, do you, um, do you have the same challenges in terms of, I wouldn't say vetting clients, but working out how you're going to be able to work with somebody when they first uh, approach you? I mean, the guys who work for me uh, don't quite share this, but I would love, I mean, it's a, and a whole conversation about procurement, but I think as a team in this little office, all our skills and our attention to detail could be applied to a small school or a small arts building. We just haven't got a chance. We haven't got a chance, you know. And you got, I even phoned up the procurement guy in the local council. And I told him, I'm coming to see you with my models. You don't have to go anywhere. I'm coming or I'm coming bringing some We're going to talk about our work. And he wouldn't let me in. I mean, they wouldn't. So my... My frustration is private houses are fascinating and every site is different, every client is different. And, I, and I'm, in, I'm really fascinated by the concept of home and what it means to people in a physical way and a concept of, but I'd still like to do something that's non-domestic and it's really hard. And I don't, uh, I think we do it well. I really do. <laughs> but if, if um, that aside, obviously delivering the buildings that you are and the locations that, uh, yeah working is incredibly challenging in its own right so you must have built over the years and in, in your yeah. former employment as well a very strong relationship of contractors and consultants that help you with that how does that yeah. actually affect procurement because obviously the minute you step into the other realm of trying to do schools and go on frameworks and bid for contract you don't have that control over those relationships that you've developed yeah, but I, I, well, the truth is we haven't got there, you know, and so I, I would, it's just problem solving. It's a bit different problem to solve when as architects sort of do the whole day, all day, every day we do research and problem solving. I'd work my way through that to still deliver, I'd hope, a good building. I don't, I do know lots and lots of builders and engineers and, and uh, subcontractors. And I do know what we can get, what's available and what's easy to put up. And I know about the guys who build off sites and who have what's but I do think I could apply that to a public building. It's just there's no way in, as far as I can see. You know, uh, I've got a portfolio of houses, and there's a lot of them I didn't. So that's I don't maybe it's a procurement question, but I think uh, in uh, locally, I think that it's it's harder to get in in a rural setting than it would be in an urban one, and there are more competitions in cities and so on. But. Jonathan, maybe we could turn to the the, the thorny question of perception which we touched on in our kind of briefing session before is um i've struggled with this with a number of um projects where i've got my head around where i live and the internet changed everything and allowed us to be living and working rurally but people who are more connected to cities 
still struggle with the idea of geography and where we are and whether we could actually service their requirements. Um, have, you, have you struggled with the same thing? Yeah, I mean, absolutely we, we have, yeah. I mean, um, we, um, there's been a number of occasions where we've been invited to competitions through various organisations that put these things together. And, um, and, and I'm sure at the end of the day, you know, it's a bit like, why would we want to appoint an architect from Lincolnshire? Um, and it, it is, yeah, it is a, it is a problem, but it, it, I think it's, it's something that we've, we've overcome as a practice, you know, we've matured and kind of grown up. And, and actually the reality is now that the right clients kind of come to us, we'll do the right, you know, those projects kind of come, we'll do the work that we're, we're doing. It would be nice to be able to do work in other places. We just finished a project in London, ironically. Um, and it'd be nice to do more work there. You know, we've just finished a project in the centre of Lincoln, opposite the cathedral. Um, so for Lincoln, you know, a fairly important piece of piece of architecture. And just because we're here doesn't mean that our work is purely about working in rural settings. You know, we are interested in working in, in more urban environments as, as, as well. You know, this is a base, isn't it? It's, it's like you've said that with with you know i think this the time that we're going through at the moment is is proving to everyone that actually you can work remotely we can work from home we can have talks online so therefore we can put a project together for someone um 300 miles away you know we don't have to be down the road i don't think well it works i mean that works for for all manner of practices of all scales that are working globally as well they manage to to find a system to, to deliver the buildings. We're doing the, the same. Um, Mary, had you ever considered um, sort of collaborating with the larger practice to try and get into different sectors to, sort of, to, to, to overcome this glass ceiling that you described? I, <laughs> I, I would I'd be interested, but uh, what I, uh, yeah, what I suppose I bring is the no, knowledge of these particularly obscure, uh, well, not obscure to the people who live there, but particularly remote landscapes and places and so on. And there aren't that, that many projects there. Um, I know I'd be, I'm open to collaboration. I think more architects would do. I was really interested in how Meredith at Mole talked about his, how he became, how he is a executive architect, worked with living architecture and that it was a positive role and things. And I think that sh it shouldn't be seen as, you know, the, lead architect and the second architect. I think we should be able to do that. Uh, and that, I'd be delighted if anyone would. But I do know that I, I did lose a job to a London architect that was we worked quite hard at. And I do think that partly, you know, can, can a rural practice actually deliver something really special? I, I've, and uh, so I do, I, I have had that happen. Um, and I do think that's a potential problem, yeah. And the, Project. It's funny about the collaboration that um, uh, David Shepherd had a lot to say about that. Really? Well, he worked at the front end of, I think, the Living Architecture project that uh, Meredith worked on for Peter Zumthor. And that again was about looking at people's um, skill sets. And he was so embedded in Devon, understood everything from the planning teams all the way through to who the best ecologist was. And could really guide the client team to resolving that rather than them having to pedal quite hard in the background. So maybe uh, maybe there is a role for you in that sense that they're you know of being the person of the land because you described to me the other week that you almost feel like you know the whole of the coastline. Well, physically, I climbed all those hills and fight all those lanes and kites but I've spent time with them and and I have built relations with planners and I mean there's a contractor I love working with and I just rang him at the end of a job they did a clay block house which fascinated me I didn't want to talk details on them, but, uh, and, and he did and he just delivered it beautifully there's a team you know and I rang him up and said can you do all my jobs in the home thank you for the and so he rings me up and said let's do something together the CLT house the, uh, the contractor came to me and said, I want to do a job with you rather than me design it, which was just really flattering. And so we delivered it together. So I, I, 
I do work really, the contracts I work with, they know that I'll come. They know that I'll be part of the team all the way through to handover and that I'll, any problem we'll solve together. So I'm quite, I hope I'm saying this right, I'm quite popular with the contractors who I'm there for them and then they have delivered back. So I've got projects through them. You know, too. A reciprocal not, arrangement that's developed. Yeah, the, 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 the Carbon Dynamic and I did the delivered a building and they are really interesting in track. They were, so the, it, there's quite a few architects, uh, I, would, I don't know who they are particularly, who do, just do a set of drawings and then walk away. You know, it is a hassle getting to Barrow, it's quite often <laughs> and it, for some people, but it's a pure pleasure for me. And I go, you know, I go and I, and I turn up to the site meetings and I see it through and I sort out problems with and I carry lead, which is really heavy, on the ferry for one of them. And it's so they they come back and say, "Would you like to do this project with me?" And it's always yeah. okay. So in many ways, it's the same. It's the same immersive experience that you're putting at the front of a project when you're yeah. really grounding yourself. That you're seeing that as as really part of not just your duty, but the joy of what you're doing. Yeah, I take it. I like to take the. It's a journey. I take go through the whole journey with its ups and downs with my clients to the end. Yeah. They're all, most of them are friends. So I have places to stay all over the Highlands. <laughs> Jonathan, can we talk maybe um, briefly about the old, the old work-life balance? Because I um, I wrote to you and said, um, can we write? Can we talk about the challenges of li living and working rurally? And you said something different. Yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, I think for me, I think my response was, well, can we talk about positive things about living in a rural location? Um, which, um, you know, are more important to, to, to me, I, I think. Uh, I mean, you know, what we can't lose sight of is that we, we have this great opportunity of, of working in space, you know, and I mean, um, I, I don't mean confined space, I mean, you know, landscape. Um, so we, we, we also have these, these, you know, great opportunities to have our constraints are things like trees, hedgerows, waters, the slope, you know, we're building on rock, the weather, you know, all those kind of things. I think there are, there are challenges when we're thinking about making architecture in, in a landscape setting. Um, but, it, but also, going, you know, going back to your point about work, work balance, yeah, I mean, it's really important that we have a... I start at 8.30 in the morning and I, with the office finishes at half past five, you know, and I may stay on until half past six. Um, but that's, you know, that's predominantly it. Um, and we, because we're a small team, we can remain really focused throughout the day and, and it's important that everyone goes home and spends time with the family or, or you know, spends time doing leisure or sport, walking the dog or whatever that might be might be so yeah absolutely it's um you know part of i guess working in a rural location is that you would expect pace to be slightly slower than being in the city i'm not sure that's always the case i, 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 I can't especially on a small practice but yeah and um, um, but, but you, you you don't work at home you've got a separate office environment haven't you yeah yeah so we have an office um it's literally it takes me if i drive to the office it takes me three minutes it's not far enough away that's the problem so in an evening when i leave i'm still in work mode when i get to the house i could really do with driving you know across the walls for 20 minutes and coming back to my head. <laughs> yeah it's 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 great it's you know it's 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 here it's, it's three fields away you're um you're in a slightly different predicament though aren't you mary you're, you're a shuffle across the yard, aren't you? Between yeah, the... I had a debate with my um, accountant about the bike to work scheme. <laughs> I use it a lot, I genuinely use bike, but he knows where I work. But I go for, I take exercise, right now I'm taking, I go very early in the morning, and it's dawn and things, but it's not, it's just what I, it's just bedded in my life, doing a lot of exercise. And luckily I have a job where I can do it as well. I've, yeah, I've made, made, made sure I can, do the things I love to do and work. But the guys in the office, as, as I leave, they say, you're going, I'm going on a site visit now. And they go, you're going on a jolly, aren't you? Mary? <laughs> so it's a disappear. But yeah. Well, that's okay if it's something that you love, isn't it? Yeah, um, I'm very lucky, I know that. Um, I'm very lucky. Um, I do have uh, my contemporaries in London are in a different, you know, a different predicament by the time they get to their mid-late 50s, in a different world. It's a whole different world. 
It is, it is with a whole different range of responsibilities. Um, on the message board, just a, just a question is whether you could show us what the view out the window is, Mary, because you keep spinning around with lovely, lovely so it's not- no, actually, no, little bit, I've got context here, which is new for me. I'm usually in the middle of, so I designed a house that, and office that's like an extension to a part of Steading. That's my friend, Finn, he makes bagpipes and his dad. <laughs> and this, this is a lovely family in the farmhouse here, these two boys and their parents. So I love it. Actually, I really like having neighbours. So a lot of my clients, particularly deep neighbours, uh, talk about living in the middle of nowhere. And I've done that. And it's slightly overrated, I say. It's nice being in a context of other buildings. Um, there's an interesting question that's been raised um, by Cameron Lintock. Just asking about the overheads of running an office, Jonathan, it might be help to put some context in, in, the, in the rural setting. Whether that allows you um, more fee to, to kind of better resolve projects, or do you feel that actually you're always being challenged on your fee percentages or the way in which you structure your uh, engagement with clients? Yeah, I guess I'm not sure our fees are any different to other parts of the country, but our budgets are. So if it's a fee against a smaller budget, then it's, it's, a, it's a less, it's a percentage against a smaller budget, then it's a smaller fee, obviously. But, you know, having said that, you know, I, I believe strongly in paying people who work in the, in the practice um, an equivalent wage to what you would get in London. You know, I think that's really important. Um, just because we're here doesn't mean to say that you should be paid any less. Um, but to, add, you know, to answer the question, I, I'm not sure. It, it, it certainly doesn't leave us with um, more cash to, to um, you know, to, to explore other things or more time, you know, that's for sure. How does it work for you, Mary? Because you, you, you've described so far that work and life seem to be quite fluid. Do, are you quite structured and disciplined with, with the work well, side of things? Well, other guys have the guys who work here have kids and girlfriends and stuff. They do. So they, I pay them properly and some of them work four day weeks. I think the whole world to work a four day week. Uh, and I'm actually delighted that they can afford to do that, but I do pay them what the, I, I hope, I hope they agree, that what the RIBA says is the medium. So they pay properly and they just work like maniacs. I have to stop them working and send them home and, and they're amazing. And then we've already re working remotely. All our all our files are on the cloud. So we're, this this is just the same as it was. It, except we used to come together more, which is a shame. You know, they sh they're here more. But this working remotely, we're all used to. As for me, I've, I've got two kayaks and three bikes. I don't need anything else. And also, one of the things I want to express, point out to my clients is you can live in quite modest small houses. And it's okay, you know, I live in a small house and I live a full and happy life. So one of my things is modesty in the buildings on, you know, the projects and they can come here and see that it's okay to live in a small house and you don't fall to bits, you know. And so a lot, because I, I prowl the highlands, like a, I've seen big houses on small sites and it gets me down or, you know, in a, so uh, living a modest life in a house that costs nothing to run barely any run makes sense I, mean, I don't really need i don't understand why everyone needs so much stuff you know, i don't i've got everything i need you both um you've both done your own stints at teaching uh, mm. i know that you were, you were jonathan you were at cambridge for a period and maybe guesting at lincoln i'm not too sure um do you think education sets up the architect for running a rural practice um, I mean, we tried to, um, you know, when I taught um, at Cambridge with Mark Tuff from Surgeons and Pace, we tried to, the, the whole studio was called Working on the Periphery, so we tried to set this kind of agenda up. It was more about working on the edge, uh, away from a, a kind of urban environment. Um, um, because we thought, you know, it was something that wasn't, um, that could be, explored and discussed more in, in this country in particular. I think, you know, people like Swiss are very good at this stuff. And um, I think it's, there, there is a tendency in schools in this country for people, people seem to prefer working in a more urban environment. Um, you know, um, 
And I think when people were looking to select studios and looking at projects, I think it was a, it was the student believe, believes, their belief was that if you had a portfolio with urban projects in it, you're more likely to them to get the work in London in an urban practice. I think that's the way it was kind of, I'm not sure that there is a huge appetite for students in particular to go out into a rural environment and work uh, in a practice, thinking about making architecture. And do you think, uh, obviously, for there's a lot of questions coming in about that sort of transition between, uh, you know, a lot of us ended up cutting our teeth in the city, not just London, but uh, other metropolitan areas, before making kind of a lifestyle decision to leave. Um, it, are there any go kind of golden tips that you could offer? Mary, would you be, I mean, obviously, you've spent most of your professional career in, in, yeah. in Scotland, haven't you? Yes, I have. Yeah, I did some work and some practices in London. I don't. Yeah, it was good. It was hard. It was hard, and there's a lot of but um, putting buildings together in a kind of precise and a lot of detailing. I did, you know, sort of in my twenties and thirties for other people, and it stood me in good stead now. So, I'm a I'm a I'm a detailer, but um, it was definitely life. I wanted to be in the mountains. It was a personal decision, and I I didn't really and. That was my, and I want to spend more time outdoors, and that still is my thing. My my ambition is to work when it's raining and be outdoors, when it's, and I'm getting there. I'm not by this time. It's pretty close, and be out. It's just it's just really important to my mental health. And I, I know we're talking about difficult times here, but it's uh, I chose I decided I chose that, and also yeah, that's and it, it made sense yeah for me and for yeah the people who had to employ me. So it's quite difficult to employ, I think. Jonathan, if you were if you were the thirty year old Jonathan Hendry again, what advice would you be giving yourself if you were stepping out into this journey that you've spent the last twenty years doing? Oh gosh! Um, <laughs> <laughs> if I, mean, I, think, I, th I think you have to, you know, if you if you're thinking about the change from being in a, an urban practice and going out to a rural practice, you have to. I think you have to be rural minded. You have to want to be in the countryside and I think that should be the first thing that's driving you you know the idea that you um, live in a in, in an open landscape and that's that's the the culture and the mindset and the environment that you want to be in I think that's really important else there wouldn't be enough you know for lots of people who would say there's not enough going on there's no culture what well, of course there is culture but it's a different type of culture you know it's not we don't have an art gallery down the road to go and see, but we have other things going on here. There's a whole, um, we're living in this rural landscape, so there is this whole kind of um, rural culture, it's about agriculture and, you know, other things that are associated to that. So going back 30 years, yeah, I mean, looking back, I mean, it, it's been incredibly challenging, don't get wrong with all this, and it, and, it, and it still is. You know, it's still very, very difficult very very challenging you know we have currently um, two design projects on you know we, we don't have 20 30 design projects you know we are constantly looking for new work and that's the challenge i think continuity keeping the work going and interesting work i was gonna i'll add to that actually just from my own personal experience that in, i call it a dirty secret and I think it's always healthy to have a dirty secret in practice, something that's going to keep you paid, ticking over, or some form of retainer where you build relationships with long-standing clients where they always need something doing, whether that be planning applications or just administrative support. That allows you then the opportunity, I think, to focus on the creative stuff that is what you're actually keen on and passionate on, but the rest of the stuff pays the bills. Do you do you ever do you have that same problem, Mary, or are you are you very much yeah. got the model worked out? No, no, gosh, don't be do no, <laughs> no, uh, no. I'm constantly looking for work, and I'm constantly hoping to have to allow the guys who work with me to have more input on the design and. Uh, find a way to do that. I promised them after lockdown we'll go on site because they obviously want to go somewhere with their wives or girlfriends, but they're gonna go with me instead. So I'm always looking for work and I do it all the time and it's a, you know can be a bit I I try not to be too needy when I meet new people. <laughs> but uh yeah that's the pro Jonathan's right it's, it's a real struggle all the time. 
to keep the practice going and it's uh, I can't stop it's now a moving practice and so on the main thing is don't get greedy for me personally I've got everything I need to but Jonathan, you've, um, you've obviously been doing this for 20 years, so you'll, you'll have seen the various ups and downs in practice. So even though you're saying you've only got two design projects, because obviously you've got a lot of other stuff on site, um, are you confident in the sense that you, you've seen this before and therefore you just know that it will, it's almost cyclical in the way it works? I mean, you have to remain uh, optimistic, don't you? You know, our, our work comes from um, the phone ringing, you know, someone's seen the work, someone's heard about the practice. Um, it's very difficult for us to go out there and, and find work. So we have to wait for the, the work to come to the office. Um, and yeah, we have to just, you know, we've, 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 we have to hope that there will be more work that, that comes through the door. And, and that keeps the, the whole process moving forward. Um, but that's, you know, that's not something that we're in control of. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to change tack a little bit. Mary, there's been a question in from Philip Christou. Um, asking about, and if I've got this right, Philip, the, the role that maybe someone like yourself could um, oversee in the direction of urban and land development over a much, much longer period of times, so 10 to 50 years. Can you see the role of an architect? Maybe um, we have in Wales, we have natural resource Wales. So I, don't, I don't know what the Scottish equivalent is. Um, of sort of almost being uh, a custodian of landscape and, and the built environment, especially in particular the way in which you're placing mm. architecture within that and sensitive uh, setting. That, in my view, land ownership in Scotland remains the, one of the major problems. We have a really fantastic thing, the right to roam in Scotland, and I take my right to roam seriously. But on the other hand, plan ownership is really still, they still use the, the language of feudalism, you know, feud, that you own a few of the land. So the big landowners will have their own way of doing it. Uh, the, what's great is the community buyouts at the moment and the, uh, things are changing fast and their, and their land is being it's taking up there are lots of good projects, not, not by us particularly, but all sorts of good community projects happening. So it's really optimistic, Scotland. And Scotland is pro-development. I mean, I tried to do a house in Dartmoor because they thought that I understood the lot. And I was oh, really optimistic and really excited. And I thought I could do it and it'd be great. It was really hard, but Scotland's great in that we there's, there's really open... Uh, attitude to modern architecture there's innovation there's absolutely no conservatism about it lots of uh lots of people i meet on in these communities have traveled a lot you know they're not it's not parochial so i it's really fabulous place to work and they're the community buyouts are exciting and i'm delighted but uh and we've tried and we haven't got them but we will i'm sure we'll get to one again I've, I've done a couple of village halls which are really tiring but they're great as well they're really um, Jonathan, if you, if you could p maybe pick up on this, because I, I don't know how it works in terms of land ownership in Lincolnshire, but uh, Jack Lyons is just asking about um, his experience of Shropshire and the idea that anything out of the ordinary, anything out of the normal is, is, is really challenging for you to present. You don't seem to be struggling with delivering contemporary architecture in these rural settings. So how have you gone about sort of um, guiding clients with that? I think I, you know, I think it starts with with an element of trust from the client with the architect. So the architect, the clients tend to give us a, a very free hand in terms of design. We ask for a, a list of accommodation if it's a house, and that's really as far as it goes. And then it's for us to create the story. And I think it's about um, having logic and reason behind everything we do. And um, you know, that starts by recording the landscape, making drawings of the landscape. Quite often, a project start by making a new landscape, and then the architecture follows. And this kind of builds and builds and builds, and then we go to planning. But we work with planning from day one, so we always insist on a pre-app every project. So from day one, we, we talk to the planners because it doesn't matter what we think. If the planners aren't going to engage, then it's not going to move forward as a project. So that's really, really important. Of course, we're building this story as we go through the, the kind of design process. 
and, and we present that to planning. Planning understands where we're coming from. Everything has a reason and a logic that is well thought about. And of course, that's quite um, refreshing for planners to hear that in a, in a rural uh, location. You know, it's, not, it's not the type of work that comes through their office every week. Yeah, and I, th I think I, I concur with that actually, because I think over the years, what, we have, what we've ended up doing is, is, is very much writing the planner's report for them so that they have confidence to understand and believe in the design rather than be constantly confronted with process. I think the, especially with working on developments, because you're obviously doing a fair bit of development work. Have, is there any reason why you've never become the developer? It's something we've discussed a lot. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to why we've never done it, if I'm honest with you. I suppose it's a bit like, you know, you stick with what you know, don't you? And, and try and do what you know well, rather than believe that I'm a developer. And develop, a developer's mindset and, and an architect's can, can be different, you know? we want to agonize over details and that's not always the case for, for a developer. You know, we've done developer housing, so we know how it works. But, but I suppose, I don't know, the other thing maybe is finance. You know, it's not that easy for an architect to go to the bank and say, I want to buy a 10 acre site and build 20 houses on here of a certain standard, you know? And, and maybe that then detracts from what we're trying to do in the day, which is run a practice. It, it's, it's not dissimilar, I think, when, uh architects or engineers get involved in systems, whether it be you know, wind turbines or building systems, it almost takes their eye off the ball of practice. Yeah. So they're not actually focused on what they do best and yeah. do well. Having said that, Mary, you, you touched on this earlier about relationships with contractors and mm -hmm. contractors coming towards you. Have you not been in that position where you start to look at joint ventures or some means of which you can start to deliver buildings yourself? Well, I, I, yeah, there is, I, I could on a very small scale, that's for sure. But I'm, I'm genuinely fascinated by this uh, client site uh, specific uh, problem. You know, that I really, I think each, each client is different and each client is fascinating. I think doing generic architecture, I always find that really difficult. This idea that people ask me about the perfect house. And that, not having a client, I, it, I just wouldn't interest me as much. Luckily, I have clients who come to me um, and that I'm fascinated by their story and I'm fascinated by why they're there. And some of them have stories that go back generations and some of them, the stories are brand new. Uh, so I, I'm not terribly interested in developing housing. Also, I, well, I got involved in a developer housing project. Did a fantastic feasibility through, I think it was a triumph. Got rid of the um, <laughs> executive home idea, completely threw them off the wall. They loved it, took it to the planner, he loved it. Then they asked for a fee proposal and that was that. I didn't get the job. I was told you'd never work in Dundee. So that's that then. And uh, I but just did, don't- did the project people... get built? Sorry? Did the project get built? As far as I know, it's on hold, but uh, I don't know how architects work for these tiny fees and how they deliver it. The, the developer was amazed at the work we put in just to get to, a pre-app, you can believe it. I just don't understand. I mean, I've asked this a few times, why don't we have, why don't we go back to fixed fee scales? I don't understand it. I mean, I've been told a lot of times that Patch got rid of them, but why we all, why, why? So I have tried developer housing and we got a really good response at pre-app, it was just really exciting. And we sorted out some of the logistics of it, the training and all that, but we were too expensive. Um, is, Ellis, is it possible to unmute Philip to ask the question? Yes, that's done. Hi, hi can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Hi, thank you. Um, question for probably for Mary, but perhaps Jonathan um, would have a response as well. Um, very often when I go to um, on trips to somewhere rural, like let's say Western Ireland or somewhere, I'm struck by, um, you know, going through beautiful little towns, uh, historic towns and, and well, beautiful, but poor places mostly. And um, the local planners you can see are just sort of out of their depths. 
and the, the way that things are happening in those towns are um, really sad um, because nobody's really guiding the, the um, with, nobody has an overview of, of the, you know, of the, of the overall situation. And it just seems to me that th there's a need for um, good architect with uh, who's local and who's um, passionate about the place and understands the culture of the place and has an understanding of what there could be there to be the person who guides the process of development and change um, through their through a long period of time through 10 20 year period um, mm -hmm. uh, you know and um, but I guess both both of you are more like kind of building architects aren't you that you build buildings and you construct them really well and have you, have you ever thought that you could be doing such a role which is on a more um, larger scale regional um, guidance of what goes on not a planner but a you know um, basically a kind of regional architect uh, rather than a city architect uh, Mary, do you want to answer that yeah well i mean there's been cases uh i just one island tari which had some terrible things happen and then they wrote the design guidelines it was just too late and a really good architect from glasgow did a beautiful project and they did these designs but it's too late so quite often it's too late what i find frightening when i go through the highlands is the buck stops with me because the planner lets more or less anything through the clients pretend they want cottages but cottages but actually they want enormous houses <laughs> on tiny sites and they want all sorts of things that, i mean they don't usually come to me those kind of clients anyway but if the buck stops with the architect you've got to uh, it's a really difficult thing I and mean, then there are not many architects actually working there are lots of people highland cad services and so on doing these things yes i do think there should be more master planning is not the word but there are some design guidelines but they're often too late now and i've i tried to go to johnny once it was terrifying really I don't, I don't even think it's really design guidelines it's more it's um it's a kind of broader than that i'm thinking of the wonderful example that always comes to my mind is um, when Luigi Snozzi in Ticino was asked to, um, well, was, yeah, was asked to do a school in, a little, in the little town of Monte Carasso. And he took that job as an opportunity to actually rethink the whole village. And, and he did that over a kind of 30 year period with the help of the mayor and, every, you know, and, and, and it was an educational process with the whole town. But it was, um, and he built a number of buildings in the town and so on, and 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 set up, well, basically scrapped all the planning guidelines that there were, that there were, you know? and okay. and gave direction to how the the, you know, general direction about how things should be done. Yeah, you know? I think it's a, it's a, it's almost a parallel uh, question, really, that that's been asked asked by Hannah Loftus as well about this balance of us talking about urban design when in fact actually there's a great subtlety to rural design and understanding scale and the sentiment of place which really can't you can't um, use the sledgehammer to, to to crack that nut it has to be embedded and it is conversations that we have with a number of clients whether they be local authorities or um, uh, or universities even if you're looking at campuses within relatively modest towns that there just isn't the education so we're back to the same problem not just within the planning system but actually within the client body of understanding the merits of time and the merits of longevity within the design process and 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 the influence of things like should you put a, a road through there or not you know or a motorway there yeah or so on you know, like um, or a big factory in that position and not that you know or a supermarket or something yeah um you know, those are questions which it's not, they're not just planning questions, they're, they're architectural questions, but at the, at the larger scale, you know? Yeah, so that's a problem of patronage, in, that, in my view. I don't know, you know, it's that we need an educated patronage. The people, who, just to have that overview, I've had terrible conversations with road men, and, and I go and see it. I go and see, but we just, it's just, I haven't found the, that thinking in many of the local authorities. They are, a lot of them are keen to look, understand and learn and work with you it's not that there isn't embedded into the local authorities that kind of 
thinking I don't. I mean, what that what I understand happened in that case, which I explained in in Switzerland, was um, they wanted to do a regional school on the motorway between um, Bellinzona and the next city, and of which Monte Cristo was sort of nearby. And so, th and that was going. All the kids were going to go from all the little villages, and they were going to all go to this big regional school. And they had been planning that for ten years or something. And then they asked Luigi Snozzi to design that school, and he said, "No, that's the wrong place for the school. It should be in the center of the village, where the where the um, where the um, convent, the old convent is. In the old convent, it should be the school in the center, the old center of the town." And they, he convinced the mayor of that, and and the mayor, together with the architect, slowly and sort of tooth by tooth put things into place. Um, we, we but that was, so that it was the political will was there, you know, um, from the mayor, basically. We yeah. had a similar schools program in the Western Isles where they grouped a lot of primary schools into big hubs, you know. Yeah. But there weren't architects involved at all. The contractors designed it, it went straight out. There were no architects, none. So yeah, that's even worse, yeah, yeah. First base on any of us. We're going to have to bring it to a close, guys, because we've run out of time, which is, which is a really good sign, I think, for the first <laughs> session. So thank you, everybody, for, for staying with us. And sorry, Philip, to cut you short. Um, uh, great session. And I'm, I'm really sorry we couldn't answer all the questions, but we tried to field as many we could on the chat board. So thanks for your interaction. Um, next session is in a fortnight, where I'll be talking with Ryan Kennehan, obviously based in Dublin and uh, John Mayo from TEDA, who's obviously been an Architecture Foundation speaker in the past, uh, about the role of the interlope, both people working uh, really in landscapes which aren't necessarily familiar to them um, growing up. It just leads me to thank uh, Jonathan and Mary. Thanks so much for contributing tonight and obviously to Alice and Rosie and for Will back at Rural Office for sorting all this out in the background. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.